we have uh, Pega Roshan and Ishmael Soto. Um, so I'm gonna quickly introduce them and then they're gonna go through some of their work with you guys. Um, so Pega Roshan is an Iranian American designer currently working at Rios um, uh, in Los Angeles. She has worked in various architecture offices in Los Angeles, um, Iran, and Japan. Um, Pega received her bachelor's of architecture in Iran where her final thesis was a women's shelter focusing on bringing the quality um, of men and women into the Middle East. And she moved to the US in 2011 where she received her master's in architecture from UCLA um, in the post-professional program studying under Greg Lynn and Elia. Um, during her studies at UCLA, she designed a collaboration um, center for Boeing that incorporated novel technology for spaces of the future. Um, after graduating, she moved to Japan, where she worked as a senior designer at Su Fujimoto Architects. Um, collaborating with Japanese architects and designers, her work has been published and exhibited in the GA Magazine and Gallery in Tokyo. Um, and her interest in design lies in bringing social equality, creating peaceful and effective spaces, and to help with the well being of future societies. Um, Ishmael um, also currently works at Rios um, in Los Angeles. He holds a Bachelor's of Architecture from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and a Master's of Architecture also from UCLA in the post-professional program um, studying under uh, Greg Lynn and Yulia. Um, his work on motion and architecture developed at UCLA was selected for exhibitions at the Vitra Design Museum, the Mac Center in Vienna, and as well as some other international um, places. Ismail has over seven years of international experience working at UN Studio in Amsterdam, Zaha Hadid Architects in London, um, Kup Himmelblau in Vienna, among others. And he has won international competitions and has worked on various building types ranging from luxury um, high-rise towers to industrial mixed-use um, districts. He has also taught at UCLA as well as um, Cal Poly LA Metro and the Architectural Association's Visiting School. Um, thank you both for joining us. I look forward to hearing about your work. Hi everyone, good evening. Thank you, Naomi, for uh, the great introduction. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, today I will talk about uh, my work in a chronological way, work from Japan, um, studying in the US and my work in Iran. Uh, the first house is called House N is Japan in Japan in Oita, Japan. And this house was designed towards achieving a gradual connection between the city and the house. To make an architecture that is not about the space nor about a form, but simply about expressing the richness of the spaces of between the house and the city. Uh, in this project, the wall concept as a conventional wall was a challenge. Um, the wall in traditional walls is either zero or one, but in this project, we challenge the concept of the wall, how to be a spectrum of zero and one, how to connect the private space to the city with this new wall concept. And uh, in conventional houses, inside of the house and outside is separate, how to blend inside and outside together to have a future house. Um, to achieve this, uh, three nested shells were designed to be in each other. The outermost shell were covering the whole premises and creating a semi-garden, semi-indoor garden, as having a green area in Sufujimoto Architects is one of the fundamental concepts that is being practiced, how to have nature inside the architecture. And um, the second shell was covering a tatami room and a bedroom, and the most inner shell was creating a living room and dining room. These uh, three nested shells were creating different spaces, a space that is next to the street, which the resident can enjoy being next to the street while they are still inside in the covered area, a space that is between the city and the house, and a space and an inner space that is more private and more secure where you can see the dog is. 
The other interesting thing about this project is that this perforation on these shells created interesting views for the residents. The picture on top is showing um, the ceiling and the roofing of this building. And throughout the different time of the day with different clouds, habitants can have different views of the sky and enjoy their views. The second project that I worked on is a house in uh, Kanagawa Prefecture in Japan. This house was also about connecting uh, nature into architecture and how to blur this boundary of outside and inside. Um, this was achieved by two different study models. This is one of the different, this is one of the latest study models. In Japanese architecture offices, there's a lot of emphasis on making physical models. Through studying different models with different angles, studying the lighting, we could change the design if it's necessary and come up with the ideal design that we were looking for. This house is a three-story wood structure and there were some uh, doors placed on these uh, open frames creating a um, void and solid spaces which would create interesting views for the residents that are residing inside and which would create interesting relationship with inside and outside. Uh, most of the functionality of the building were placed on the first floor, as you see on the plan on the left side. And uh, on the second floor, there was a tatami room, um, which was designed for a tea house and a guest room. And this project is uh, my project at UCLA, where I was studying at um, UCLA Supra Studio with Greg Lean and Julia Corner. It's a Boeing, it was a collaboration center for Boeing. The intent of this project was how to use new technology um, for the future of architecture. How is new technology affecting us as designers and as architects? Can we design future buildings with drones? How can drones be new media for designing? For this reason, I studied various footages of drones, uh, flying the drone uh, over buildings. And I conclude that machine's vision is a struggling with depth. And with this, I conclude that when the drone is flying near the building, the blobs are smaller. It sees buildings volume with smaller blobs. And when it is flying further from the building, it sees the volumes and edges as bigger blobs. And this led me to design this formal language and come up with this formal language that you see on the left. The next phase of the project was designing this uh, collaboration center for Boeing. As uh, Boeing has different offices around the world, collaboration is very vital for Boeing and uh, with new technologies such as HoloLens and virtual reality, um, they need more adaptable spaces rather than solid spaces that were used um, during old ages. For this reason, I um, propose these tensile structures to be in the middle of this collaboration center. These tensile structures could open and uh, to the size that the user needed to, so that they can see through the HoloLens or virtual reality, different parts of an airplane and study. And when there is no need for collaboration, these tensile structures could close off and between the cubicles, there would be visual connection. The next project is also a project that I did um, during my time studying at UCLA is um, um, called Moon Phase, which was populating a kinetic facade with the help of a robot arm. The intent was to revitalize and activate Bonaventure Hotel that is in downtown Los Angeles, which is always being looked at at being separate from the urban context. How can we connect this building to the urban context? How can we activate it? For this reason, a panel was proposed that had dual performance function. One side was a solar panel and one side was media. The solar panel was helping with the sustainability and the media would activate this building and would be an attraction point for people. Um, this is a video that um, shows studying of this panel and how we studied uh, different uh, angles or an, of different openings of this panel and how is it affecting us. We still see the same slide. Oh, sorry. 
Um, okay, just a second. Okay. Um, what about now? Yep. Okay. Oh, thank Thanks for telling me. Um, so this is the studying of the panel, um, pan one full rotation of the panel. We studied the shadows during the day with different openings of this panel and how is it giving us different shadows. And in the next phase, with the help of the robotic robot arm, we could populate this kinetic facade and see how does it look if we want to apply this to the Bonaventure Hotel. This is the final elevation. So with the help of this kinetic facade, as you can see at night, the building looks very activated and very inviting for the visitors. The next project is a project that I did when I was in Iran. And this is a project was about designing a library and auditorium in center of a university to be hub of the university. And the challenge of this project was how to design um, two buildings with two different um, spatial functions. We achieved this by connecting, um, we achieved this by connecting, sorry. Uh, we achieved this by connecting these two different buildings with uh, evolving the structure together. As you see here, the structure was making it woven and homogeneous while the functions are two separate functions. The other um, design criteria for this project was adding ponds for the foyer of the building because this building is um, in a very warm and humid um, area of Iran. So uh, bringing water helped um, to help facilitate this problem. Um, the other project that I want to share with you is my undergrad project that I did during studying at um, uh, BIHE in Iran, Baha'i Institute for Higher Education, which my, you might not have heard about it. Um, this, um, this institute is the response of Baha'i community to oppression as Baha'is are barred from higher education. My main purpose in designing this project was to bring equality of men and women and bring awareness towards women's rights in Middle East. For massing of this project, um, there were uh, different uh, data were applied to the massing. So the massing is uh, completely coming from data of the site. As you can see in this diagram, the massing um, was raised from the contour lines of the topography. In the second um, step, it was rotated for the best lighting towards the best lighting. Then the main axes and entrances were added and affected these massings. And then it was rotated towards the views and the openings were added to the buildings towards those views. The massing moved up the ground uh, for air circ circulation because this building is in north of Iran, which is very humid. Then the green areas were added and parkings were added to the volumes, main roads were added, and at the end, main courtyards were added to this massing. This building complex has various functions. This is the cultural wing of this complex. It has an amphitheater, it has a library and a self-service um, cafeteria. Then there is the educational wing for these battered women to educate themselves. And then there is a rehab center. If they have problem, if they need a therapy, they could attend this. And there are some dorms for them so they could stay in this building complex and they don't need to stay at their homes. 
And these two views shows interior of uh, on top, interior of um, educational facility of the building. I try to have this educational facility to be visually connected to each other and to be full of light and, uh, and to have a very convenient space for them to study. Below, you can see the library. The library was also visually connected to outside to the courtyard. While women are sitting here and studying, they could watch their kids uh, play in this courtyard. And the sections of the buildings show you how this massing is like a very smooth cloth just coming on top of these volumes and uh, covering them. This is the aerial view of this building complex. These uh, lines, there were lines designed on the site and they were massing, designed in a way that gravitate people towards this building and activate it. And uh, to, this was uh, the way that I designed to be, bring awareness for human, for women rights so that other people can come to this place and enjoy and they could attend the events in this cultural center that was designed in the front of this uh, building complex. The other important thing in design of this building complex uh, was adding all these corridors because of air circulation. Since this is in north of Iran and it is very humid, uh, this was one of the other design criteria that was um, uh, important for me to bring in this building complex. And thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, I guess I'll, I'll start next. Hard to follow such a wonderful presentation, Pega. <laughs> sure. So can everyone see the screen? Yep, you're good. Mm -hmm. awesome. so, I wanna start by thanking Julia for inviting us to the summer lecture series. It's, it's always great to come back as an alumni. Um, when I was a student uh, with Greg Lynn and Julia, we had Boeing as an industry partner, which allowed students to have uh, in some ways a client so we could explain simple complicated ideas in, in, in simple terms to all of the engineers. Um, let me start by saying a little bit about my professional experience. Right after graduation, I moved to, to Europe to work for some of the architects that inspired me to study architecture in the first place. I was working in the competition department with Wolf Breaks in Vienna, Fahadid in London, and also Team Nilsen in, in Copenhagen uh, on a, a wide variety of typologies from, from ferry terminals to high rises. Uh, and also in Europe, I had the opportunity to work with UN Studio on a 3 million square foot mixed use development in Frankfurt. When I returned to, to home, to California, um, I wanted to hone some more technical expertise and, and get licensed. Um, during this period, I, I worked at SOM and a project that is recently completed is this high rise in the Mission District. And currently I'm a project designer at Rio's. Uh, we have a project under construction in Atlanta, which you see on the right. Uh, and we worked on a lot of different mixed use and large scale projects as well. I wanted to kind of start by saying, as a child, this is me, my dad um, is a residential architect, but as a child, we are very inquisitive. Um, we ask a lot of questions and, and that was me asking all kinds of weird questions. And I, I wanna say, as, a, as I've been practicing in many firms, I've seen that it was a young, uh, recent grad that would bring all that innovation to practices um, as, it, as through collaboration, um, they would always ask the right questions. And I, I kind of structured the presentation just, just asking a few questions um, that I asked myself as a student or as a practitioner. So for example, can architecture be inspired by nature? Um, in my 
Cal Poly thesis at San Luis Obispo. I was interested in nature uh, and I wanted to extract in information and inspiration from that. Here you can see there's per performative and aesthetic aspects that one can inspire uh, to, to do in architecture, even if they don't seem clearly related to our field. Uh, a leaf, for example, it's, it's both structure, uh, but it but it nurtures itself through all these uh, capillaries. And then a, a poison dark frog, it has a figural skin that that is very, very uh, beautiful and mysterious and it detracts prey from itself. Um, so when we work in large scale pr projects, uh, my thesis was a waterfront uh, building in San Diego. And I was looking at modernist tradition of glass boxes um, with disregard to, to climate. Uh, California is, is, is basically a desertic climate uh, in which I wanted to integrate a, a lot more opaque uh, surfaces into a high rise. And I did this through figuration of the apertures, as you can see, um, giving the, the whole complex uh, cohesive expression, but also kind of on the perf performative side, just as a leaf, uh, ornament is also functional. In this case, the idea was that these uh, capillaries on the skin would bring uh, cold water from the Pacific Ocean and cool the building in the summer months. So an another question I asked myself as a student is, can a building be designed from the inside out? Uh, a lot of times we design the skin and then we think that is uh, an a piece of architecture, but with uh, Greg Lynn working with Boeing, when they asked us to create a factory for the future, my interest was how can I change the way the assembly line works? In this case, instead of a Fordist linear assembly line, it was the notion that all parts would converge to the center and therefore making a more compact envelope for, for the factory. Uh, we visited the factory in Seattle and I realized there was a lot of gantry equipment uh, in the ceiling that would create a, a very dangerous uh, place for, for factory workers. So instead of that, uh, all parts move at ground level and that liberates the, the ceiling for a, a large skylight, creating a, a wellness for the people that work in those factories. Uh, in terms of its architectural expression, you know, instead of a typical Costco box, let's say, that we see uh, in factory typology, I wanted to, to compress the space even more and have the facade react to the figures inside in this case, the figures inside produce a new architectural language that is expressed on the outside that could be, uh, for example, a branding mechanism for Boeing as they deploy these more compact factories in different locations across the world. Um, another sort of question in the design process is how do we redesign the typical factory sliding door? Uh, in this case, the, the door itself is an aperture that responds one-to-one -to, -one to the product inside. So uh, another question, can architecture fly, for example, is a, probably a, a crazy question to ask, but in the design process of this building, motion was a key uh, element in which we had um, a room that would fly. It would go from, from Sunset Boulevard to the top to enclose an event space. And Sunset Boulevard has a, a rich history of billboards, um, signage, so the blades not only make the, the room fly, but they, as they move, they create images when in motion as they have embedded LEDs in it that can signal different messages. So this, this notion of a, a hotel mass with an object that, that flies around it creates a, a dynamic urban proposition and the, the rest of the massing, uh, it's subtracted and unfinished, let's say, uh, as it's carved out. And that produces a good contrast with something that is completing openings as it docks into itself, right? Um, this project was featured in Vitro Design Museum under the headline, Can We Live in a, in a Robot? Um, and I think as you know, technology advances and we we're spend more time on Zoom calls like now and on the phone, I think architecture needs to start becoming more dynamic uh, and perhaps motion uh, is an answer to, to getting people outside again, let's say. Um, so also in the competition design process with, with all these various firms, we asked ourselves questions uh, in a collaborative manner in the design process. And in this one, 
the question, can architecture become a city within a city, uh, was, was important because we had to deal with 3 million square feet, which was composed on a sort of a classical podium with towers on top. And in this case, the towers are arranged so as to create uh, vistas uh, out, out of all sides. And also the podium is eroded to create entry points on all four sides. The program of the complex was two office towers and then two residential towers that had both market rate and affordable housing uh, under the concept of creating a city for all. The podium uh, had kindergartens and outdoor spaces and it was flanked with retail all around to activate the city streets. So here you see how one project can define the skyline of a city. Uh, at the scale, you see the tallest tower about 54 stories and then the, the smaller residential towers flanking it. Uh, in terms of enclosure, we wanted to produce a variety of textures as it has to sort of live in context with very ornate uh, German classical architecture. Here you can see that kind of contrast between glass and the stone masonry buildings that surround it. Um, in the design process, uh, Ben Van Berkel was always very happy that the building had an air of futurism in it, because if you think about it from the point that you win the competition to the point where, where it's built, there's sometimes five to 10 years in these large scale projects. So you have to design not just for the context in which it exists, but also imagine what context it will exist 10 years later. And then ask yourself, is this still innovative after that much time has passed? Here you can see uh, a space for people the the site was formerly closed for about 25 years and now it's a, a space for people um, that frames the sky with the four towers flanking it so another question that we asked ourselves during a competition was can architecture produce a new public space this was uh, with 3xn in copenhagen we were we won this international competition um, where the premise was we had a lawn that was facing the university library in Sydney, Australia, and then uh, a plaza that was facing an auditorium that was used for graduation. So the building was right in the center of those, those plazas. So we wanted to stitch this together. And we did that by eroding the building and lifting it up at the corner, almost as to produce a gateway where people can flow through um, in the diagonal as it's kind of the, the path that you know people more were more likely take so once you kind of go in there there's a an urban living room that is uh, a mixing of both administrative faculty of the university and students um, and it has a variety of teaching environments quiet lecture rooms or more open plan situations that will make you feel like if you're in your own house studying um, in architecture be informed by its context. So there's a, a project we're working here at Rios in LA uh, and it's located in Atlanta and it's currently under construction. So we at Rios, we care about the history of the place and we want to produce architecture that relates to that. So we were studying that there was a lot of history of vernacular industrial buildings on the site and also railway uh, history that defines density in pockets of the city. If you look at the urban planning, um, so our proposal for this office complex was to take that language from historical trestle rail bridges, which always express structure. Uh, and in this case, we have a exposed steel skeleton that, that, that is both ornamental and structural. And then in terms of its, uh, to add warm to it and, 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 and its structure, we used some uh, CLT wood, which is uh, acting as a diaphragm structurally on the building floor plates. Another aspect uh, at Rio's that we care about is the integration of the building and landscape. And here, the landscape is so well integrated that one might question notions of time uh, if this building was there previously, or is it a, a brand new building? Uh, and this is because it's so well uh, orchestrated with the natural environment where, in which it sits on. Um, in addition to the larger building, we added two smaller masses, um, which create interstitial public spaces in between. Here you see 
a public plaza in front of a restaurant. And then in the back, you see a larger public space we call the nest where you can have performances and people can gather. Another kind of design driver is always uh, producing spaces for, for people. And that then means using materials that have some tactility to it. So you can use bricks, exposed wood, exposed steel to kind of add that, that uh, human scale to it. And then as a conglomerate, I think it works very well with all these different pieces, uh, sometimes questioning notions of time and signaling different eras in the history of that site. Can, uh, ha can architecture address housing equity? So I wanted to share a little bit of work from my students. I've been teaching with Stephen Phillips, my professor at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in a program called LA Metro. So this is a program here in LA that is a satellite of the main campus. And students are tasked with producing new typologies of housing that sort of mix uh, both market rate, affordable, and also transitional housing to produce uh, equity in, 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 in the housing that we, we much need in Los Angeles. So here Violeta Smart produced a, a very interesting complex that adds additional programs to kind of amplify that idea of equity. So there's business incubators, homelessness services, job training centers, uh, youth centers, and all of these produces a, a, a massing that, that has a very unique quality that, that expresses individuality as opposed to most housing you see built in LA that is more driven by performa. In the section, it shows a dynamic interplay of different types of people uh, it, that, that can provide moments where they can collaborate or, or apply uh, chance encounters to, to better their, their, their lives in the city. Um, part of that studio, we, we always try to have different students produce different responses that, that influence and reflect their own voice. So as an educator, I'm always working on trying to find what is what interests them, what is, what is their passion. And then in the end of the quarter, we always have 30 students that have completely different uh, response to the same brief. Um, this is a question about, can architecture learn from history? And it was a seminar I taught this spring at UCLA. Um, students were looking at historical global precedents, in this case, the Mercarnas of Middle Eastern architecture. And the way we studied it was to extract um, different typological parts of that, in this case, the aggregation of the tiles, uh, texture, for example, or how it, the infinite aggregation of, of larger pieces could create a new whole. So all of this came together in a pavilion design that has traces of this design reaches the students did, but at the same time produces uh, a new type of architectural expression. And the same design process, here you can see another group of students looking at Chinese, Thai and Burmese vernacular traditions in architecture uh, and produce these sort of uh, scale as objects that then get fused into a singular whole uh, and produces an architecture that sometimes questions notions of time. Is it, is, it, is it a modern building, a contemporary building, or is it an ancient structure that sort of landed in a park in downtown LA? Here we have a student looking at Japanese architecture uh, and construction methods, and she proposed uh, three volumes that have different uh, spaces inside, and it's all using uh, timber construction. Uh, and there, another group of students uh, show that by looking at the past, you can achieve a great variety of inspiration uh, and, and extract a, a great variety of different forms of expression. So my, my answer is yes, can architecture answer all these questions? Uh, it can, and I'm looking forward to seeing what all of you uh, will create and what questions you will ask yourselves as you embark in your academic journey. So thank you very much. Thank you both so much for your presentations. It was really inspiring. Um, so something I actually thought was really interesting is that both of you are from completely different sides of the world. You both came together and graduated from the same program at UCLA, the MSAUD program. And then you both, again, went to the opposite sides of the world and have come back and are working at the same office again. So <laughs> I'm kind of, I guess I'm just curious how 
both of you see, I mean, you both went to different undergrad programs, obviously, but how you see your education um, and your interests, especially in technology at UCLA, um, playing a role in your very different, I know, I guess, similar um, professional careers? It's a very open-ended question, but <laughs> just let us start. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess for me, um, I, Greg Lynn was a, a big inspiration since I started, uh, I started architecture as well. And a lot of the practices that I worked for, for example, with Bricks uh, or Sahadid, were in for the, influenced by his, his uh, seminal book, Animate Form. Um, so technology and the way that Greg kind of could see the future before it happened uh, was important to me. Um, so now, you know, when we study motion and mobility and things like that, I think uh, that, that, that could be the future of architecture as well. Um, we just kind of have to work towards that. So we also have uh, some questions in the chat right now. Um, this first one is from Milo, and I think it's um, for Pega. The question is, when beginning these structures, you point out lighting and airflow as factors that must be accounted for. What specifically do you look for with regard to these things in order to design your projects? Okay, thank you, Milo, for the great question. Um, should I share a screen again or should I just talk about it? Oh, either is fine. Oh, okay. Um, well, I'll talk about it maybe. Um, so, lighting and airflow factors. So specifically, uh, when I said lighting, I was paying attention towards uh, when the studied the lighting and when is the best lighting uh, hitting the building. So that, um, that was the point that I could design where to put the windows in this building and where to have openings in this window. That's how it affected it. And in regards to, you said, airflow factor, that also affected the massing. And as I was saying, um, because that building is in north of Iran and it's very humid. Most of the houses in north of Iran are in uh, Pilotis. So they are, on, they are not on the first floor. They are on the second floor so that the air circulation can go underneath the building for the reason of humidity. And that's why some of my massing uh, was like coming up and uh, then there was columns holding it and then going down for this reason of the airflow. And then there was also, I put some uh, windows as a clear story on top of these massing so that the air can flow inside the building. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> another question from um, Millie in the Jumpstart program is um, um, both, for both of you, I guess, again, um, both of your designs have extremely unique modern um, shapes. So in your design process, um, do you have a main inspiration, um, I guess, in nature or other buildings? Um, and what are the main issues that um, you're dealing with related to style? Um. I'll go first. <laughs> and so for me, uh, the main inspiration as I was uh, explaining the, uh, my last project was uh, how to have a building that is coming from the site and is coming from the contour lines of the topography. So it has the least effect on uh, nature and at least destroying it. So for me, that's something that I would like to always consider when I'm designing a building. Um, and then you said it has unique modern shapes. Uh, and then as I was um, telling you the design process, that's how the modern shapes came from. Like the massing was coming up from the topography, it was rotating towards the topography. And then some parts of it, some of the design language, I wanted to be smooth. This was for a women's shelter. I wanted to be very convenient for them, very welcoming, soft shapes. So that's how it was affecting, I guess, my, uh, my design. Yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's a, that is a great question. I think for me, 
uh, as a student, I was always trying to, I, I will first I'll start by saying I don't believe in style. Uh, I don't think style should be something you should worry about, but every project is dependent on its context or on a, a research that you want to apply to it. So when I was a student, it was, you know, one project could be about nature, the next one could be of robotics in architecture, the other one could be about motion in architecture. Uh, and every project was sort of a manifestation of that research, let's say. And then when you work in practice, then there's other things you deal with that are not necessarily style. You have to deal with uh, clients, you have to deal with uh, building codes. And um, at that point, you need to create a narrative and and create produce architecture that's more for people than just for your own kind of stylistic uh, fun, let's say. Great. Um, I guess um, another question kind of in a similar vein to this last one was about um, how you design, I, I guess this is for Pega, in the Middle East with security and privacy in mind for these highly, I guess, um, contextual, I guess, yeah, con contested spaces. Yes, um, thanks for asking. I guess that's also another uh, great question. And for that, I want to share um, screen because I want to show it on the screen. Um, so uh, actually that was uh, another main important factors when I was designing this, it was very important factors. Um, because this this building was in uh, rural areas of uh, north of Iran, and as I say, it's very humid and it's surrounded by greenery. Um, but the building was designed in a way that from the front view, this is the main street, main road front view, you could just see this surface, this facade, and you don't know what's going on behind it. So that was the main um, security point for entrance. And then this was like diagonal on not um, on the main street. So diagonal, if you go on this street, you would see this attraction. So these um, building complexes are, um, are designed in a way that the privacy is gradually happening. I put the dorms at the end of this building complex. So you don't have that much um, um, to go to it. And then the other ones, buildings are more for both men and women, because these parts are more for bringing awareness to having social events. So these are the active parts and these are more quiet parts and very, very secure parts. Um, so that's how I implemented in my design. Great, thank you. Um, I don't wanna keep taking over the Q and A. So if the students, if you have more questions, don't be afraid to write them in the Q&A box. Um, I guess I had one question for Pega and Ismail, which is relating to something what Naomi asked you earlier. Um, and you might have each individual kind of uh, experiences, but what do you think made this kind of decision that you went out, uh, you Pega, you went to Japan and you Ismail, you went to Europe and you gained experience professionally in a different context, in a different place where you had never been before, maybe traveled, uh, but not worked there before. What kind of experience did that add to your education? What values? And uh, is that something you would recommend uh, to, to students to do? Yes, definitely, I would recommend it. So for me, it was like after uh, graduation, I wanted to work internationally. I wanted to have uh, experience, uh, international experience. So I went to Japan and uh, I totally fell in love with Japanese architecture and uh, Japanese offices. And I remember at that point, I asked Julia, thanks to Julia, that I said, uh, Julia, I don't know what to do. I love it here, but I don't know if I should stay here or continue uh, my work experience in the US. And she told me, just do what you love. So I followed her advice and I just did what I love. 
And I realized that uh, although Japanese architecture was more like conventional and designing based on uh, physical models, but that was uh, adding another aspect to my education. And that's helping me to combine these two, the technology that I learned from UCLA and then the um, Japanese architecture that I learned from Japan. I, uh, this was an amazing experience that I had working in Japan and studying at UCLA with Greg Lin and Julia. It was amazing. So I uh, totally recommend it to everyone who wants um, international experience to travel around and work in different offices because each office um, teach you a unique thing in regards of design. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I guess for me, I, I had never been to Europe before I, I went to Vienna to work with uh, Kupi Mablau. Um, but for me, that move was sort of an extension of the Granklin Super Studio, let's say, uh, because those practices were functioning almost as an academic design studio. Um, they were always having uh, their own students kind of come in or Greglin students or Patrick students uh, and do the com design competitions. But like I say, there's this, this uh, naive, like question asking that the younger uh, people have that propels those offices to do you know, innovative work. So I kind of wanted to be part of that and, and learn the design process from all of these different uh, practices. And, and then another thing that is interesting about architecture, it, it is kind of like a universal language. Uh, you can study architecture and it's, it's a language that is spoken in Japan and Middle East and Mexico and the US. So it, it opens up opportunities to, to actually travel anywhere you want. Um, and I would highly suggest it uh, because architecture, you know, you have to experience it in person to really understand it at, at points, to really understand what it means. You know, I studied all these all these books and you know publications, and then when I saw them in person, you know, it was it was totally different experience. Um, so that it it does open opportunities to collaborate with people across across the globe. Right. A question that's kind of related to this is. Um, both of you, because you went so far away, did you guys already have connections in these places or did you just, like, how did these connections happen? Um, I guess that allowed you to move to such far away places. Um, for me, I did not have connection, but I just, uh, actually, uh, now I remember, uh, my connection was that, I saw Fujimoto work while I was studying at UCLA. It was during one of our theory classes with Sylvia Levin, and she showed us uh, Serpentine Pavilion by Su Fujimoto. And um, I studied his work, and I totally loved it, and I was mesmerized by his design. So then after graduation, I thought, why don't I go and work for him? That I was really interested into his work, and I found it super cool. Um, so there was no person as a connection, but it was uh, the introduction of his work happened to me while I was studying at UCLA. And so Fujimoto comes to UCLA for lectures and I watched one of his lectures and I really loved it. So for me, that's how it happened. <laughs> yeah, for me too. I, I don't really know anyone in Europe, um, but I was fortunate that, that Greg is very close to Wolfricks. Um, and one time he, I remember he came into the studio, Wolf Ricks came into the studio and, and Greg was like, hey, that guy wants to work with you. And I kind of started that first move. Uh, it, was, it was pretty, pretty seamless from uh, UCLA to practice. Uh, and then from, from that, I think all of these, all of these guys, you know, from that, that I've worked with from Greg and Wolf and Saha and Ben Burkle, they're all part of the same kind of ambition of producing similar uh, architecture that's experimental and innovative. Um, so it was, Thanks to, to that first kind of step, it was easy to, to change uh, to different practices and learn from, from all of them. Awesome. So I guess now stepping away from those kind of more practical questions, um, this is a kind of funny question. So you both are really interested in like the future of architecture and how technology and all this stuff um, plays into that. So one of the students has a question asking, I guess your opinion about why in so many futuristic movies, everything is so dark and polluted when all of your projects have so much plants and all of this stuff. I think that's a funny question. That's an interesting. Yeah 
That's a good question. I think that shows the role of us as designers. So like we design what we want to see. So, and uh, depending on the function of the building, if I'm designing a center for women to help them, I want it to be super light and uh, white, full of light. So that's for me, I guess that's how it is. I don't see future spaces to be dark or gloomy. I design it the way that I would like it to be. Yeah, I agree. I think I think a lot of those kind of futuristic movies uh, have a certain aesthetic, but I think in the future, I think cities are densifying at a rapid rate. So um, it, it, it is possible that cities do look like that, congested and, uh, you know, all crammed. So every addition to the city uh, has to be carefully designed, but I don't think uh, the city is, is is influenced by architecture as much as it is more of uh, politics and development uh, and capital, right? So at, at the end of the day, uh, we need to make an impact in all of these fields from urban planning to development to make sure our cities are lively and, and human-centric as we planned it. Otherwise, uh, other forces will take over. Yeah, so this actually goes pretty well into the next question, which is about um, densification. So I guess this is mostly focused on Pega on the Fuso Ojimoto house that you showed, because I guess also a lot of his work is kind of single family homes, but in a kind of dense urban area. So was that something that you guys um, talked about um, in the office or something that you talked about when you were designing the house? Um, because it is kind of very spacious and just for one family, but in a dense city. Um, that is true, yes. Tokyo is very dense and um, the, sot, the lot sports, the sites are super small. I guess that's uh, those are the challenges that the Office of Suji Fujimoto was trying to solve that uh, in the first project that I show that how to connect this very small site to be connected to the whole city. And uh, when you live there, you don't feel that you are living in a very small box. So those were one of the questions and one of the challenges that uh, designing in Tokyo, when you're designing in Tokyo, you will um, confront it. And the other thing, I guess, uh, the other uh, he, of his solutions is to bring nature into his architecture. So that's another solution that will help you not to have boring spaces. When you are connected to nature, when you see a tree inside your house, uh, then I guess you feel more connection, uh, connected to your roots or um, uh, to, um, to nature and it feels better rather than being in a white closed uh, box and you feel like uh, it's a dungeon in the city. I guess those were his solutions. Okay. So I think unless anybody has any more questions, um, I'm going to say thank you on behalf of all of us. It was really great hearing you guys talk about your evolution through your academic career into where you are now. Um, I hope the students learned a lot about <laughs> where they could end up. Um, yeah, Yulia, if you have anything you want to yeah, I just also want to thank uh, Pega and Ismail for joining us today uh, for this second lecture of this uh, lecture series. And um, I was really excited to see what you have been up to in the last couple of years uh, since you graduated from UCLA and how successful you have implemented your kind of um, learnings into the many multiple offices you have worked with. And I also want to thank you for sharing all these experiences with our current summer program students. Um, the TNARC and Jumpstart students are very excited to meet, uh, meet you and connect with you. And so thanks so much for sharing your work and uh, sharing your time with us uh, for this lunchtime lecture. Thank, Thank you, you Julia. Julia. Thanks for having us. <laughs> it was an honor. All right. Thanks and take care Thanks. and hope to see you soon. Yes, <laughs> hope to see you. Thank you. And all the students have a nice afternoon session in your courses. All right. Mm -hmm. Bye.